Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Food as Medicine webinar today, February 5th. And it's good to have you all. And we are looking forward to this wonderful discussion with a great panel. So as we like to start our events, we have our promise of community action. So feel free to join along saying it at your own desks or homes. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So here at the partnership, we have our wonderful learning community and learning community team. So the purpose of our learning community resource center is to help us to analyze outcomes and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models that help alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. And here we have our LCRC team. As you see, we have Tiffany Marley, who is the Director of Practice Transformation, and some of you have met Hyacinth McKinley, Senior Associate, and we have with us today Lil Dupree, Senior Associate for Research, Courtney Kohler, Kevin Kelly, Jeannie Chaffin, and myself, Amy Roberge. So today, we are focusing on food as medicine, partnering to improve food security and health outcomes among vulnerable populations. And we are very excited for everyone who has joined us today. So today, we have as one of our panelists, Dr. Stephen Chen. Dr. Stephen Chen is the Chief Medical Officer of All In Alameda County and brings an integrative health equity lens to All In's work on poverty. He is working to lead the scale and spread of a food as medicine model across the county, health clinics, health systems, and food systems. And a graduate at Stanford University and Stanford School of Medicine, Dr. Chen is a board certified family medicine physician who completed his residency training at UCSF San Francisco General Hospital. So we are very excited to welcome him and members of his team to tell us about this food as medicine model and so we will turn it over to him. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Amy. Really excited to bring this panelist on the West Coast to you all in the nation. Uh, we know that there's a lot of alignment between your work and our work, and we want to bring this collection of team members together to highlight the work that we're doing here in Alameda County. Food is Medicine, partnering to improve food, insecu food security and health outcomes. So we're, we're really marrying two issues here, social determinants of health and health outcomes, and putting it all together with this intervention that is really quite innovative in who you're going to hear today. I'm going to spend the next 20 to 25 minutes sharing more about All In and the Food is Medicine initiative and then really turning the rest of the conversation over to this panel of amazing colleagues here who are going to share, share with you how we are doing this work. I want to start with a quote. So this is a quote from Wendell Berry. He is a farmer and, and environmentalist and activist, and he said, people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. And I want to say that this is so true because in medicine, most of us really got no training in how to use food as medicine in a clinical visit. And many people in food can do a lot of great work in creating interesting foods and tasty foods, but maybe not have much of a health lens on it. I want to add my own corollary, my own quote at the end, which is, and both food and the health industry pay no attention to soil and the agricultural industry. And there's this disconnect really between food, health, and soil. You will, you will see how we are trying to connect all of these silos together to produce uh, improvements in health outcomes and food insecurity for our communities. Oh, I am going the wrong way, guys. Sorry. So, really four parts to this uh, this PowerPoint presentation, who is all in Alameda County, then really grounding it into what our communities and patients are, are facing, and then 
more detail about our Food as Medicine initiative and then really the opportunity to hear our partners and highlight their work. So who is all in? I want to say that, you know, we had um, a slide deck here that was animated, but somehow we weren't able to animate all this. So bear with me because there's a lot of text that would have been animated. But really, All In Alameda County, we were here on the West Coast, we're a very large county. And our work at All In, in terms of the vision, is to envision a whole Alameda County without poverty, where everyone is thriving in healthy, vibrant, and resilient communities. And our mission as an intergovernmental agency is to lead, innovate, and collaborate across public, private, and community sectors. So we're different in that regard because as a government agency, we're working with agency heads, working with community-based organizations, and the community at large to catalyze the equitable policy and system changes required to address the root causes of poverty. And we have three focus areas, and the food as medicine work fits within the first focus area of basic needs, where every resident in Alameda County will meet their basic needs for food, shelter, and health care and safety. The economic empowerment piece with obtaining an income, that's for self-sufficiency, and then the, the final piece in terms of the generational transfer of, of, of education in terms of a quality education and positioning the next generation for success. So just wanting to start out with the end in mind. This is our picture of the work that we're doing. I'm going to spend a lot of the slide deck going through some of this, but just so you have an overall view of where we're going, we have this circular kind of globe, if you will, with the clinic in the middle, and we're launching, we just launched with Tiburcio Vasquez. We have this green area of a food pharmacy that I'll go more into detail with, and then the bottom area, which is the behavioral pharmacy. So these, the green and the blue, these, the food pharmacy and the behavioral pharmacy is the modular infrastructure that we're adding to clinics across the county as our way of equipping clinics to move a little more upstream. And what do I mean by that? Again, this would have been animated where this Food as Medicine initiative is really moving upstream and midstream because we're clinics. And so clinics often are trying to make the gap between their downstream clinical work and their upstream work, and this situates the clinics really with community partnerships at a midstream level. But if you take it from the left to the right, we're doing what clinics do best, treat, prevent, and I would add with food as medicine, we can reverse chronic disease. And then two, screening for food insecurity, something that often has been left to social services. And now that we in health clairs and health plans are looking at, at communities at a, at a more holistic level, we are integrating those pieces in. With this intervention that we'll talk more about, that leads to that second bubble on, or the third bubble on the right, which is the improving health outcomes and improving food insecurity. And we have some data to share with you about that and our, some of the future work that we're doing. Ultimately, it leads to that last bubble on the bright bottom, which is policy change. And I'm going to just name an, a, a word that we're using now because we're doing some work at the state, and that is really medically supportive foods. Medically supportive foods as healthy foods that become a, health, a covered benefit by health plans. So imagine your practitioner at the clinic is prescribing you food, and now the health plan is actually paying for that healthy food to address and reverse and treat diabetes, for example. I'm going to go through a few set of slides on just the problem. And this is that we as clinics are often downstream. This picture is, of, is kind of emblematic of, say, Dr. Mack, who's in the room, and myself. We're seeing patients every day. We're mopping up the floor, if you will, with our medical assistants. And we're so busy just waiting for patients to come into the clinic that we don't see the, the overflowing um, faucet that's bringing all the other business to us, and if you will. And that overflowing work is, uh, is really the social determinants of health issues that are really above our field of vision. Those downstream issues are the things that most clinicians are comfortable with, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, anxiety, depression, but they're often 15 years in the making. And the question is, why are we waiting for people to come to us? How do we actually move a little more upstream and midstream? So we've tackled food insecurity and social isolation amongst the many social determinants of health. I want to say the problem is this as well. It, there was a New York Times opinion uh, that was put in August that was based on an important study 
basically show that our food is now killing too many of us. If you look at the circle on the left top, dietary risk now sur surpass tobacco use, sur surpass blood pressure, surpass obesity, surpass even kidney disease as, is, as an impact on the number of people who are dying per year. And that's accounting for about 500,000 people per year across the U.S. This is very common to many of us. Chronic, preventable, and I would ask again, reversible disease. 70% of Americans are overweight or obese, 70 million with hypertension. And these numbers are staggering, because if you imagine a typical clinic, typical clinic may be serving 20,000 patients. This is all over the country. 100 million people are projected to be diabetic, and then we have 130 million, or about 40% of our population already with chronic disease. The expenditure is massive. 86% of our health care is spent treating chronic disease. This is a slide that highlights food insecurity and health inequity. And when I ask the question in sessions where it's more interactive, I say, what do you mean by food insecurity? What, how, what, is, what are people's understandings? And what I'll get is, oh, it's dealing with hunger. Um, I actually want to just refine that to say it's, or it's just about access. And what we try to do is to say it's about it's actually both. It's limited access to enough nutritious food, and we add in the healthy, active life. It's not enough just to give someone donuts or pizza to solve someone's hunger, because we know if we do that for 15 years, that will lead to diabetes and obesity and all the other issues downstream. So food insecurity and food security is really coupling nutrition, nutritious food with access, and then the output of healthy, active living. This slide is important because it tracks food insecurity across many years, and the big gray area is the recession, the Great Recession. You'll see a, a bump up. This is kind of by racial or ethnic data across the nation, where maybe now at 2018 down to 11.1%. This is nationwide. Our Latino, Latinx community is 16.2, African American community 21.2. So the inequities are there. What's the connection then between food insecurity and chronic disease? So I shared the slide about it killing many of us in the country, 500,000 a year. I shared the slide about what the food insecurity, um, the demographics. Well, these are the, the, the numbers. Uh, this is the data. You have food insecurity, you're going to have 53% higher likelihood of developing chronic conditions. You have food insecurity, you're going to have a two times more likelihood to develop diabetes. You have food insecurity, you're going to have 47% more ER and hospitalizations. And then when it comes to the numbers of cost, one hospitalization for low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, about $17,000, versus $650 for a family of four if you give them healthy, nutritious food. It's fairly easy. The math is easy there to see. The last bubble there is that, or the apple with the plus, is that in our communities where we serve the most vulnerable, our patients are spending 43 to 70% of their income just to get the necessary adequate produce as recommended by the USDA. The other piece that I want to highlight in terms of another social determinant of health is social isolation. We've, we're talking about food as medicine and, and food insecurity. I want to highlight this because this is another very important piece of the puzzle and that I think will continue to get more and more press. Social isolation, in fact, uh, through a massive meta-analysis with, oh, I think, around 200,000 patients, has been shown to be equivalent to smoking 14 cigarettes a day in terms of your impact on mortality. Imagine that. You're being socially isolated. Your chances of dying from that are as equivalent to smoking 14 cigarettes a day. And it actually surpasses someone who drinks six drinks of alcohol a day. It surpasses those who are treated with hypertension, with medicine. It surpasses people who are exercising for obesity, and it surpasses even obesity and its impact on mortality. So then the question is, so what? What's the intervention? And you'll see that I have this picture of the pharmacy. And normally, if I were in front of you today, I'd be interacting with you and asking you to the community out there, you come to me in clinic, you have pneumonia, I give you a prescription for your pneumonia, where are you going to fill it? And most of you are going to say, I go to the pharmacy. And so the pharmacy is really a 
a, a system of drug delivery right now, pharmaceutical delivery for medicines that are easily accessible, hopefully, through a pharmacy if you have one nearby, and, and cost effective. And so we took that analogy to say, well, let's think about these delivery systems around food and behavior. And that's our model. So I'm going to talk about the food pharmacy piece, and you'll hear a lot more from Hillary Bass later today, but the three principles of our food pharmacies are we are attaching, we are attaching farms to clinics, essentially. And so here in the Bay Area, we're so proud of talking about from uh, farm to table, and so we're doing from farm to clinic. And our food here is sourced from a dig deep farm. It's a regeneratively grown farm. Uh, you'll, you'll, we'll talk more about that. We have food prescriptions and food as medicine training. I'm going to talk a little more in detail about that, but that's the visual, and then I'll go to the, the bottom half later in the talk. It's a lot, it's difficult to train and change the mindsets of those in the clinics. I trained probably 25 years ago at Stanford and I got zero training in food and how to use that um, in a clinical, meaningful clinical encounter in 15 minutes. I trained at UCSF for family medicine for three years, zero training. I only got my training in fellowship for integrative medicine. And so what we've done is we paired uh, myself and one of my colleagues who's a chef MD and we've created a training program where we train not only medical providers, but nutritionists. We train behaviorists. We train other so-called food prescribers on how to use food as medicine in their short visits. That is coupled with behavior change with what we do best, which is give prescriptions. And so we have food prescriptions. That training encompasses how to use food to treat chronic disease, as well as how do you address food insecurity. This is a mindset shift, and that's a very important mindset shift, and it takes time. So what does that look like when you have a delivery system at your clinic? This is what we had at, at, our, our, first food, at our first clinic, which was at uh, Hayward Wellness. And you'll see that we had food grade bins with fresh locally grown vegetables, beautifully taste, beautiful and tasty, in the middle of the clinic, waiting room, staffed by the food pharmacist, F-A-R-M-A-C-I-S-T, play on words, just like our food pharmacy. Uh, so it's not a heavy lift for the clinics. Where does the food come from? This is a formerly abandoned parking lot that, you, that the Dig Deep team used to regenerate and basically use permaculture approaches to build the soil and on top of this parking lot and create the farm. They use regenerative practices that I'll talk about, but this is in an unincorporated neighborhood in Alameda County. It's one of the poorer neighborhoods with high uh, food insecurity and high crime and, and lots of um, challenges for our patients. That's Sasha there. She's with a number of youth of the greenhouse they erected as well as this, uh, the beds. The, the actual principles, again, and this is talking about the connection to the land, is the farm uses polyculture, multiple types of food are grown, uses black gold composting, it uses worms to build the soil, mulching, this is all part of regenerative agriculture, and it impacts our planetary health with carbon sequestration, improved soil health, which ultimately leads to higher nutrient density for the foods that we grow for our patients. This is Troy, he's the farm manager, and that plot of land on the right was actually uh, what Sasha was dealing with in the few slides before. This is a beautiful farm now, vibrant, and uh, has murals, it's, it's really a community asset. And this is really about a green economy, because this Dig Deep Farm is actually um, fueled by the Sheriff's Department. And Hillary will talk more about that, because you're going to hear more about 21st century policing and, and public safety as an investment into infrastructure and communities. And this is really an opportunity where the sheriff built a farm to train and re-employ hard to, hard to um, employ as well as re-entry communities to work the land, get certified, and eventually get jobs uh, within the Dig Deep system. Just as we in healthcare deal with social determinants of health, you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear Hillary talk about criminogenic factors to crime and how do you move upstream. 
So that's the food pharmacy. Now we're going to move into behavioral pharmacy, and I'm really excited to have uh, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Markle here, who we will hear from, to hear about how this behavioral pharmacy group medical visit and their program of bringing open sources work integrated with clinics like Tuberculio Vasquez um, in terms of how a group medical visit looks and what it actually is comprised of. I want to speak to the, with the concept of a behavioral pharmacy, and again, I'm probably stealing the thunder for Dr. Markle because uh, she, she is the originator of this term. Behavioral pharmacy is, again, a lot of those behaviors that we tell patients to do in primary care. Exercise more, eat better, reduce your stress, get some social support. We essentially write them a prescription, and then we send them off, and we wonder, I'll see you back in three months, and we wonder why nothing changed. And it's similar to me giving you a pharmaceutical antibiotic uh, or an antibiotic medicine and you have no pharmacy to actually make it happen. We send our patients off essentially to places where they don't have integrated pharmacies. And so the idea was to build a behavioral pharmacy and to integrate that work into the work of group medical visits at clinics and to combine the two to provide this uh, behavioral pharmacy. It's all-in-one experience. The all-in-one experience is four components. You'll hear more again from Dr. Markle. It's all experiential. Patients are moving together with a movement coach, tasting plant-based snack or a meal that's sourced locally, also from Dig Deep, Deep at times, connecting with a number of health coaches uh, that are working on behavior change on a weekly basis for a 16-week dose, and then being, which is really essentially the mindfulness relaxation approaches that they learn to re-regulate the nervous system around stress. What's different about these group medical visits that are linked to behavioral pharmacies? They're all experience. It's not about me going up there lecturing you about diabetes or hypertension. It's movement. It's doing. It's everything. It's, it's building community. It's transdiagnostic, and this is wonderful because in clinics we often think, oh, I can only refer this patient to diabetes group. No, you can refer a diabetic, you can refer a hypertensive patient, you can refer someone who's obese, someone with multiple comorbidities, somebody who has just pure food insecurity, they can all come. It's an all-comers group. Sorry about the numbering there. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and then the productive piece is it was great for administrators at clinics because we're, we're able to see far more patients, 16 to 25 patients in a half day um, once we ramp up. And that's far more than a typical half day where you might see eight to 10. I wanna share then, I wanna close in the last, in the remaining five minutes on outcomes. And so this is some of the outcomes that uh, we had with the behavioral pharmacy linked with the food pharmacy at Hayward Wellness, where I used to work as the medical director. The number of fruit and vegetable intake went from five to 5.9. You may think that that's not much one serving a day more, but if you extrapolated that across the United States, that's 30,000 lives saved. 81 to 122 minutes, around 40 minutes more of exercise. We all know that that's helpful for the body as well. So these are health-related behaviors. The next slide shows the impact on outcomes. And so we saw a 47% reduction in depression. Um, this is based on PHQ-9 scores, 14.5 down to 7.7, .7, a drop in anxiety, 20% isolation, social isolation, 13%. I know that Dr. Markle probably has updated de um, slides or updated data that's been pooled that she can present a little later in the conversation, but this is just some of the early work uh, that led to uh, this opportunity to go big at the county. And this is very important. This is a 16-point drop in blood pressure. And again, when we looked at the data, this is not due to increasing blood pressure medicines, not due to increasing antidepressants in the previous slide. This is the effect of the behavioral pharmacy and the group medical visits. This always was great because I think our, my CEO and my previous job and others would love this slide because they saw that we were able to reduce hospitalizations and ER visits by 77%. So 22 admissions and ER visits six months prior to the entry into the group and then down to five. This is all pilot work. We've, it's been published in a, in a journal article. We are looking towards the scaling. I'll share more with you um, in the slides to come. I'm going to combine some of the future work that we're doing in this slide just to, just to highlight it since I have the platform. We have across the whole county multiple food pharmacies that have launched in various uh, 
kind of iterations of the food pharmacy. Just last week, and you'll hear from the Tiburcio team, we launched, uh, Tiburcio had a great launch, um, and we're two weeks in. And the other clinics are going, and in fact, at the bottom, you'll see that the Fremont Library just contacted us and asked, how would food as medicine look at in library settings? And in fact, yesterday, I was in a, in a meeting with uh, schools in Alameda, and they're asking, how would food as medicine look in schools? I'm going to share this bigger global picture here, which is what I started with, which was health and food and soil were disconnected, and now health and food and soil are potentially connected, which essentially leads to improvements in human health, soil health, and planetary health. And you'll see that clinics and farm stands and hospitals are in the center, connected to growers, food recovery, the food bank, healthy retail, connected outwards to patients, community organizations, workforce, health plans. I want to acknowledge a number of people who have made this possible, certainly our leadership from above, our supervisors. Uh, we have great leadership from Alameda Alliance. You'll hear from Scott Coffin today, the CEO, really advanced forward-thinking work on the public uh, health plan side. You're going to hear from Open Source Wellness founder, Liz Markle, Dig Deep team from Hillary Bass, and then our Tiburcio team with Dr. Mack and Jessica Jamison. With that, I'm going to I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague who's going to help us on the panel presentation, and this is going to be Karen Ben Moshe. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, my name is Karen Ben Moshe, and I am the healthcare program manager with All In, and I'm going to introduce our panelists and um, ask them a couple of questions. Um, so let's see, I'm going to start with Hilary Bass, who's been working with youth programs throughout her career. She's worked with youth on probation to help guide them and give them the tools they need to make healthy decisions. She's worked with building the REACH Ashland Youth Center, and at present she works with multiple public and private partners to find innovative methods for bringing positive options to people living in the unincorporated Eden area. So, Hillary, um, Dig Deep Farms has eight acres of land, which I know is growing. Can you talk a little bit about the work you've done with Food is Medicine and then also about how you got connected with community-based health clinics? Sure. Thanks for having me today. Um, so, I work for the Alameda County Sheriff's Office and um, I started working in the unincorporated area of Ashland about 15 years ago. Um, and I early on met uh, a deputy who is uh, now my boss and now a captain, but um, we were both finding ourselves grappling with how to address some of what we were seeing around poverty and crime, uh, well actually crime in the area, and what we sort of figured out by getting to know the people in the community is, is that um, really there was a dearth of every possible healthy amenity in this particular neighborhood, and um, in particular, uh, access to healthy food, access to park spaces, a walkable community, uh, places to gather and be social, um, and uh, uh, access to jobs. And all of this was contributing to what we were seeing on the back end, which was uh, crime and reports of violence and, um, and incidents that deputies were having to respond to in an enforcement manner. So we have basically spent the last 15 years working to, as Dr. Chen uh, talked about, um, stop mopping up the water, but turn off the faucet. Um, and where do we find the ways to get upstream of what we're seeing uh, on the crime side? So um, we've done a variety of things like build soccer fields and build boxing gyms and um, create places for people to play and gather. and break bread together and get to know one another and build relationships with not only their neighbors but also with deputies and work towards real problem solving through trust. Um, but we also wanted to find a way to create local jobs. Um, Dr. Chen mentioned the green economy and I would highly recommend reading the Van Jones book, uh, Green Economy, <laughs> because that's what led us to launch Dig Deep Farms back in 2010. Um, I will spoil the book if you haven't read it. Uh, and if you don't plan on reading it, he basically says that if we, America, were to invest in establishing a new green economy, aka jobs that were beneficial to the earth, 
and intentionally trained up and hired people into that economy who had been previously, um, you know, had barriers to access the traditional economy, uh, like those, those who have um, criminal backgrounds or young people, we would be really winning as a, as a country. So we thought that was a great idea and foolishly started a farm. Uh, I say foolishly because we had no idea what we were doing, but thankfully we found Troy and Sasha uh, who do. And um, as a result, we now have, um, yeah, about seven acres in production in the unincorporated communities of Ashland mostly. Um, we've turned blighted properties into small plots of urban farms. And um, the, originally the intent was to create jobs for people coming directly out of periods of incarceration. Uh, but we have learned over time that you need people who really know what they're doing. So um, Troy and Sasha uh, are, I would like to uh, coin them as the future pharmaceutical company with mm -hmm. an F, um, <laughs> because they are scientists by all, uh, as far as I can define them. And they are, um, they are training their staff in permaculture design and urban farming and all of the principles that go with that to use uh, practices that are, as Dr. Chen said, beneficial to the earth, which are ultimately beneficial to the body. And as they practice these, um, these principles of earth care, people care, and fair share, um, the staff uh, and the people who end up consuming the food, I think, have a sense of purpose and a sense of health and well-being that um, really trickles through through everyone, and they have a, a job that is um, a living wage job, and that's critical to the equation. Um, so what we wanted to see happen was we, we had high hopes that the people of Ashland would just start purchasing this produce from the farm because they needed produce to eat in their homes, and that would inherently sustain the jobs uh, on the farm. What we found is that, um, also as Dr. Chen mentioned, behaviors and patterns are hard to change. And when people are accustomed, who live in a food desert, uh, to shopping at the local liquor store for their items or the McDonald's for their families, um, convincing them to buy produce straight out of the ground next door is not an easy task. So um, we piloted food as medicine actually early on with Tiburcio Vasquez uh, through a grant funded by the Kresge Foundation to see how it would work if women who were pregnant uh, and, and um, diagnosed with, um, oh, Dr. Chen, uh, gestational, gestational diabetes, diabetes <laughs> thank you, um, um, then they would get prescribed a year's worth of uh, produce boxes delivered to their homes every week. And the outcome of that test was significant in the increase in consumption uh, of the produce and changes in their um, health. So we thought that is the way to go, and it has been, um, it has, we've continued to work with uh, Dr. Chen at Hayward Wellness and Liz with Open Source Wellness um, <laughs> to continue to test the model and now scale it with All In and in partnership with to Bercio and um, with support from Alameda Alliance and Scott, who you'll hear from, we see the future of this being that if in fact or when policy can in, in fact be changed to consider food a covered benefit, um, the demand for locally produced food would have to go up, which would therefore um, create a demand to turn many, many more vacant blighted lots into urban farms. It would create a huge increase and uptick in jobs as urban farmers, as well as jobs for people transporting the food to the, the produce, the pharmacies, and uh, also jobs as pharmacists, all with an F. So for us in the Sheriff's Office, um, creating this local food economy is, um, it goes hand in hand as equivalent in, in benefit to the health outcomes that it also achieves. Thank you, Hillary. Um, I now want to turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Markle, who's a Linus licensed psychologist researcher and department chair of community mental health at CIIS. 
Um, Elizabeth's current area of study and innovation is around combining clinical expertise with social entrepreneurship to create sustainable, thriving cultures of health and wellness. And so open source wellness has really been a key partner from the beginning. So Eliz, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what makes the behavioral pharmacy model unique and the opportunity it provides to address not only physical health, but also mental health and well-being. Thanks, Karen, and, and thank you for highlighting mental health and well-being in here. Um, I am a mental health clinician by training, as is my co-founder, Dr. Ben Emmer Aronson, and we met and started sort of just gestating this idea when we were both in training in integrated primary care behavioral health, which is a long way of saying bringing mental health support right into the primary care context. And we started tracking in that context what we now call behavioral prescriptions. And back then we just called them things that doctors tell their patients to do, like you should eat differently or you need to be less stressed. Um, and as we started tracking them, we got clear that most of the providers, regardless of their professional identity, were giving most of the patients, regardless of their diagnoses, the same four behavioral prescriptions. And Stephen highlighted these. It's eat better, exercise more, reduce your stress, and get some social support or some meaningful connection in their lives. And then they would say, Good luck with that, off you go. And Ben and I in the early days would say, wait a minute, if we write a prescription for antidepressants, it would be unethical to say good luck finding them. So we set out to create a behavioral pharmacy or a delivery system for one universal prescription. And I would abbreviate that prescription with four words, move, nourish, connect, be. So physical activity, healthy food, social connection, and stress reduction. And so for the past four years, we've been doing this, piloting it first in a community setting, then in clinical work, then in low-income housing settings, and now in corporate settings to really animate existing communities as platforms for health and well-being. So if my talk had a title, it would be Community as Medicine. Um, James Rouse is famously quoted as saying, a community is a garden in which to grow people. So while we're on the theme here of soil and garden and growing, the question that we sort of wrap all of our design around is, you know, what are the necessary nutrients that make thriving the natural outcome of humanity? And I would say that physical activity and healthy food and stress reduction and social connection are some of those key ingredients. When we set out to do this, we had a couple things in mind. One was that it had to be experiential, that we weren't going to replicate health ed or health promotion or digital therapeutics, that we were going to actually do with people the things that we keep telling them to do. So at any open source wellness site, we don't tell people to eat better, we actually eat good meals with them and we actually all do physical movement together in a community that's playful and joyful and inclusive. Um, we were also really committed that this work had to be democratized, meaning we weren't going to replicate Whole Foods or Pilates or anything else that people with privilege already have access to, that this had to be fundable in a sustainable way. And I can share just a little bit more about the funding model for this. The last thing I'll say is that we really believe that health can be powered by human connection. So the, the folks who facilitate open source wellness are not licensed medical providers, they are health coaches and peer leaders. And so they, they participate not as an expert dispensing information, but as a human being that has their own vulnerability and their own vitality and they're sort of sharing um, that which is common and universal among us. I think that's important, especially in an era when doctors are increasingly screening for more and more things, right? We're screening for SDOH. Now we're screening for ACEs, which is fantastic. But then these poor providers in a 15-minute visit are supposed to do something about it. And um, I think open source wellness has, it has increasingly been positioned as an intervention not only around chronic disease, but around resilience, around building the intrapsychic and interpersonal skills that help us be happy and healthy and well and thriving. I want to be brief here. Um, thank you, Stephen, for sharing some of the outcomes data. And I, I do have updated data that sort of aggregates across different clinics, so I can share that with anyone who's interested. Um, what I'll say about the funding model, and I really want to credit Dr. Stephen Chen here for helping us figure this out, is that that even though this program is run by health coaches, when you merge it with a group medical visit, 
where one provider pulls patients aside, does individual short focused visits, and then bills for all of the participants, you end up just about doubling the productivity and, and the, the revenue generation of that one provider, especially in the context of an FQHC. And so for anybody out there listening who's maybe not in California and thinking, well, we could never do this here, the good news is that you can, that, that we've sort of built this out in a way that we can license this model and, and support folks in communities to leverage what they have as a platform for human health and thriving. So I want to turn it back here. I'll just say opensourcewellness.org is where you can learn more about this specific component of the broader food as medicine, community as medicine bundle. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Scott Coffin, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the Alameda Alliance for Health, a nonprofit public health care plan formed in 1996 by Alameda County. Uh, Scott has worked in California's public health care and hospital administration for more than 24 years and has dedicated the last 11 years to integrating Medicare and Medicaid services in the public sectors. And I, I mean, I know I personally don't usually think of Medicaid managed care plan as like the most innovative um, organizations, but I think we're going to be proved wrong today um, and that innovation ca can come um, in unique spaces. And so I'm hoping that you can share with us what attracted you to this model and why you think it's important for health plans to invest in innovative models like food as medicine. Well, thank you. Two important questions. And yes, I do hope to <laughs> convince you that uh, innovation and managed care uh, go together. Okay, great. <laughs> So at the highest level, uh, you know, the, the, under the all-in program, the, the most, I think, attractive attribute that stood out with Food as Medicine was the alignment of our missions. Uh, Alameda Alliance, you know, our mission uh, is to improve quality of life for every resident in Alameda County. Regardless of status, regardless of who you are, we, we serve and support a broad range of individuals and it's about a quarter million people. And we can't do it alone. We know that. We just can't serve that many folks. And the All In program I think, addresses important insecurities. And besides, you know, the food insecurity, there's housing insecurity, there's uh, immigration insecurities. Bottom line, we all have insecurities that we're working through. And the privilege I think we have in serving Medicaid is that we're dealing with with people who have multiple diseases, multiple conditions, and layered upon that, different types of insecurities that we have to, to figure out and address. And you know, the other part that, that really stood out to me in, in the, the program outcomes was not only reaching the, the rising risk populations, but it was also the high risk populations. When we think of high risk, just to put it in, in, in perspective, 5% of the Alliance's membership uh, equates to about 80% of medical expenses. So when you when you translate that, you know, uh, in, into real numbers, we're we're talking about 15,000, 12 to 15,000 of our patients uh, drive about 600 million dollars in medical expense. And the opportunity that we have is is not so much to adjust that cost curve; it's really to impact quality. And that's our priority, and that's why our mission is focused on making change that, that, that results in quality of lifestyle changes. And that's exactly what the Food as Medicine program drives toward, and that's why there's a partnership. So to the first, to the first question, uh, I think the closing comment there is we have to find ways to invest in community-based programs because that's, that's the only way we can create that scale to meet all of the needs that exist. And so the opportunity that we have here with this program, and I think for everybody that's connected in on this, on this meeting uh, and exploring some of these concepts, is think about scaling. How do you scale it? And that's, we're at a very exciting time right now of, of scaling. Uh, the linkages between the physical health and the mental health, substance use, uh, medication management, all those things that we all struggle with in, at different points in our life, bringing that all together. And that's what managed care is about. 
And uh, can I, is it okay if I jump to the second question? Go for it. All right. Um, or do you want me to wait for About you to... the policy systems? Or which question? Well, the uh, the why is it important yes, to help do clients it, to invest? Yes, do it. Do it. Go for it. This is going to take me about an hour, but I'll, okay. I'll consolidate <laughs> it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, we all read about it in the newspapers online. Uh, you know, Medicaid is going through tremendous change right now. We see what's happening in Washington, uh, for that matter, globally. You know, people are really taking a hard look at their at their Medicaid systems and trying to figure out what that future generation is going to look like. Uh, California's Medi-Cal program, you know, has has undergone a number of changes over the last six months and is going to continue for the next five to ten years. Uh, Governor Newsom has instituted executive orders as well as significant policy changes that, and through his budget as well as just through legislation that are going to change positively a lot of access to services that we've been asking for. And, and one of those is really aligning the whole person care model and expanding it to include these flexible in lieu of services. You know, food is one of those components. Housing is another one of those components. Taking a broader look at these services and saying, now, you know, in a, in a prior period, they were not fundable, but now they are. And, and what is left is for communities to get together and figure out how do we put the solution together. That's the innovation. And so, fortunately, there are those that have uh, innovated in front of us that we can follow. And I think we have to also extend ourselves uh, to reach out and, tr and take some risk because, you know, life takes risks and, and so does <laughs> Medicaid expansion. So <laughs> the backbone of the safety net system, though, is, is, is where the patients are treated. And that's where, when I mean community-based solutions, is really focusing in on the safety net and tying those partners together. So there are three important pillars when I was thinking about this question. You know, one is invest in resources. And as I mentioned, community-based solutions. That partnerships with, with primary care clinics and other nonprofit organizations that are um, already connected into the communities. Don't try and rebuild or innovate again. Just tie into what's already there. Second is commit to integrating social determinants of health. Uh, and this is commitment into the new models of care. This is where we're tying the traditional care management, complex case management, things that we talk about, how do we help people manage transitions in their life. And now we expand that definition and we have a new definition. Um, and that new definition includes a lot of those in lieu of type services. All right. And then thirdly is explore alternatives, challenge the status quo. Um, you know, connect with clinical and non-clinical people in your community and find out what's working. Uh, you know, food as medicine is an incredible asset to any community. Um, really, when you start to talk with folks about how they're eating, how they're managing their life, you start to understand, and certainly at a, at a physician level, you really get the details there, right? But casually, you know, you can get a lot of information by asking people but find ways to integrate into the local safety net and create a sustainable program through innovative funding. That's what we're all gonna be challenged to do, is find a way. And that's my challenge to everybody listening, find a way. Great, thank you for um, convincing me. <laughs> um, so now from Tiburcio Vasquez Health Center, we've got Dr. Portia Mack who joined Tiburcio as Chief Medical Officer in June 2017. Dr. Mack is a board certified pediatrician with a long history of working in federally qualified health centers. Um, she is committed to the health of diverse low income and underserved populations as an, and is an advocate for social equity. And with Dr. Mack today is Jessica Jamison, Jamison, who is an accomplished and performance-driven public health leader, equipped with a strong professional foundation in quality improvement, data analytics, and health systems management. Jessica is the director for clinical uh, director for clinical quality at Tiburcio, and um, so I want to turn it over to Dr. Mack. Tiburcio launched Food as Medicine as its clinic in um, Ashland about 
oh, a week and a half ago, <laughs> um, literally for all of you on the phone last Monday. Can you talk about the work it took up front to get the clinic ready for the Food as Medicine launch? In two words, it took a lot mm -hmm. of work. Um, overwhelmingly, the logistics, and Jessica's going to talk about that, but I wanted to say that um, when Stephen reached out to us, like, we, we knew we had to do this. Um, as Dr. Markle uh, commented before, we screen for so much. And one of the th um, philosophies that I employ and spread is that I don't want to screen for something unless I have some type of solution or some type of plan. And so this was very topical. As uh, we all know, food insecurity is huge. I mean, again, we can write a prescription for insulin, but if you don't have healthy foods, if you don't have, um, you know, any knowledge of what healthy means. I mean, healthy can mean for some simply switching from dark soda to light soda, mm -hmm. which I have heard. And so um, in that 15 minutes that we have with the patient, there's just no way we can do a deeper dive. And so um, this, this program offers us the opportunity to not only screen for food insecurity, but then let, let's have a plan and then let's work on it. Um, and so uh, we were all on board with the concept. It was just the logistics because one of our uh, biggest challenges is that we had just switched to a new EHR. And how does this work in our new EHR? But I really want to turn over to Jessica who's taken a phenomenal lead on this and has done so much work and can talk more about the day in and day out um, uh, planning that went into it. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so just, I guess, to give a really brief summary about Tiburcio, we are a clinic. We're in Southern Alameda County, a federally qualified um, health center, patient population roughly 28,000. Um, so when Dr. Chen came to us, as Dr. Mack mentioned, we were excited. We knew that we needed to do this. Um, first steps were, all right, we need a few champions to lead this initiative. Um, that's when um, I stepped up, super excited, as well as my colleague, uh, Jen Hauser, who is our registered dietitian. So we went ahead and we led the charge, not really knowing all that was going into it, but we knew that it absolutely had to happen. Um, that's when we went ahead and we worked diligently with our uh, clinical services coordinator. She oversees all of our training um, EPIC-wise, um, which is our EHR, and we also worked hand-in-hand -hand with our clinical um, site manager for our San Leandro or Ashland site. Within that, we knew that there would be several meetings regarding workflow, not only operational workflow, but also EPIC workflow, um, or EHR. Um, we also needed to get the staff as excited as we were, right? So we had several trainings, including one site-wide kickoff, which in that, as um, all of you guys might know who run clinics, you know, shutting down a clinic for a period of time does take funding. Um, and so we were able to uh, close down. Actually, we offered this during a lunch hour for all of our staff, um, just to make sure that they were aware of, you know, the new and innovative program that we were selected to participate in. And that, I think, was the, um, it was the initial kickoff, but that's where everyone, you know, everyone and everything started coming together. We had teams in behavioral health, um, you know, our MA staff, our front desk staff, everyone coming together and really excited knowing that absolutely this is what was needed for our patients. We then um, provided the science behind it um, for all of our clinicians to be on board so that when they were referring or when the MAs were referring the patients, they had the science behind it and they had other tools in their toolkit to offer as well. Um, Gosh, there's so much. There's marketing and promotion um, that went into it as well. And I feel like daily, and we know this, um, that it will absolutely be successful, but we know that there will be bumps in the road. And I think that's um, where it comes to just having a solid team to be able to address that and bring it back to the importance of our patients. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, 
So one reminder for folks on the phone is to please send questions via the Q&A um, and our hosts are um, compiling those and we'll have some time in a couple minutes to get to hopefully your questions. Um, and so before I turn things back over to Stephen briefly, I wanted to ask everybody um, sort of on the panel to give us one word that you think describes the future of food as medicine. And so I'm going to go around the room here, um, and I'll start with Liz. One word that you think defines the future of food as medicine. I'm going to go with liberation. Yes. Scott. My word is necessity. Great. Hillary. Oh, boy. So much pressure. Uh, I would go with covered. Awesome. Dr. Mack. Imperative. Uh, community. Great. Foundational. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so I want to go to, oh, we had, were you going to talk about? The, the future. Just okay. a few minutes on the future. Okay. So I can, sorry, I'll yeah. go back here. Um, so Dr. Chen's going to talk for just a couple minutes about the future, and then we'll do the Q&A. So just, I've already touched on it, but really the work now in Alameda County is to scale. Uh, so part of it is the operational scale at the clinic level, the building out of the sourcing of the food with Deep Deep and other partners. So if you imagine a whole network of clinics, imagine now a whole network of urban agriculture, urban farmers working together to source food in this, in this green economy. The other piece of the future is data. And so we know that we've started right from the beginning setting up the data infrastructure, setting up the data use agreements so that we could demonstrate the impact mm -hmm. of these interventions on our patients' health as well as food insecurity outcomes. So that is kind of the topical or the uh, kind of big picture spread of within Alameda County. We have around 10 different health organizations when, and each of those health organizations have multiple clinics. So our goal is to spread to each of those 10 and to sustain it over the years. The new information that's coming is that, again, people are hearing about this and schools and libraries are, are approaching us to figure out how does this work in those settings. And then I want to turn it over to Scott to talk a little about just some of the policy issues that you're seeing at the state level. I'm happy to jump in as well because I think there's a lot of implications here that California is going through, but that many of your states will be as well when it comes to Medi-Cal. Yeah, as, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, California is, is reforming its Medicaid system. And I, I think I do agree it's time to take a look at how we've been connecting our systems of care together and testing at a local level, how well are they really working together? Um, I'm excited about a lot of the policy that's that's being uh, formed right now in Sacramento uh, because it's it's they're actually engaging at a local level with county leaders to really ask the question, you know, what do you want it to look like? How does it need to operate? What is the best way to connect the currently fragmented systems of care and bring them together? Of course, I, you know, I, I'm uh, flattered to be at a table like we are today with pioneers that are, you know, talking about this in advance, and it's also exciting to have that legislative and budgetary support. I think to Hillary, to your word, you know, around, you know, making that a mandate, you know, making food a, a, a mandated benefit is something we all need to really communicate to our legislative leaders, you know, to make sure they understand the importance, as well as these other factors of uh, insecurities that are being addressed right now. The, the housing insecurity is another one that's really getting a serious look at it. But this is years in the making, right? And I think, you know, it's exciting, it's exciting to see the, the, the changes that are happening, uh, realizing it's going to take us several years to really roll this out. And, and make an, an impact. But I think together here, what we're doing and what I'm seeing is folks are coming together on a, on a shorter timeline, right, and, and pressing forward and trying to address some of the food insecurities, health insecurities, et cetera. So. I'm just going to add one piece to that, just that we also have representatives and legislators that are approaching and asking how do we do this work beyond Alameda County? How do we spread this to multiple counties? 
and we're tying that into possible legislation that's happening. And I think the final piece is just to say, I know we've talked about food as a covered benefit and we've I put out the word medically supportive food. The other half of that equation is we put in uh, nutritional services vis-a-vis -vis behavioral health coaching or behavioral coaching really to capture a lot of the work that the behavioral pharmacy and the open source wellness team is bringing to that, that food is an important piece and it de definitely improves outcomes and you can amplify that with the behavioral support and coaching that, uh, that couples with it to magnify all of that. So I want to just end with those pieces and then turn it back over to the uh, facilitators to really open this next part of the conversation up, the next 30 minutes to the all the participants listening. I know many of you have questions, so pass it on to Amy or to Lindley for that part. All right. Well, thank you so much to our wonderful panel for going into all of those wonderful details about your program. And we did receive a few questions. Um, so I know you touched on this a little bit as far as how you inform patients um, about food as medicine and the food pharmacies. Um, so if you have any additional details about what the response has been so far for those programs. Sure. I mean, I can say it continue at Hayward Wellness where I was, where we have a lot, the most experience, uh, patients continue to want to uh, they want to continue to have more prescriptions for food. So that's one. Because right now we're a pilot and we can, we give, at Hayward we were not giving 16 weeks. Now at this, with this scaling at Tiburcio, we are giving 16 weeks. So we're hoping to address that. The other piece is patients continue to want to be in community with each other. And there's an opportunity to not only launch the work in the community health center setting with the behavioral pharmacy group medical visit, but as, as Dr. Markle, as Liz has mentioned, they do their work in community settings apart from the clinic. And so in a sense, it becomes a potential transition point to patients leaving the clinic, not leaving the clinic, but continuing the community work, the community as medicine work in a different setting so that we can make space for other patients that want to attend. And then I would just say that how patients hear about this is really because we're doing universal screening. Every patient from an, a pregnant patient to a pediatric patient to an HIV patient to a geriatric patient, whatever patient that is coming in, they are getting screened for food insecurity. And then we have our triggers for what that leads to in terms of workflow. And Jessica, do you, I don't know if you have a sense yet of how things have gone over the last week and a half. And I know in my mind, I've been seeing it as sort of a, you know, the first couple weeks take all the, there's kinks and we've had issues with the, label printing and, you know, sort of the signage and, you know, anytime you start something new, there's going to be stuff, but I know that there's already been a lot of interest and I don't know if you have a sense of any of those numbers yet. Yeah, in terms of the, uh, the food pharmacy referrals, uh, we have roughly about 50 um, now. Um, and then the group medical visits, you know, our kickoff again was last week. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, six participants there, but we nearly doubled. We had 10 today. So we're looking forward to seeing that increase in that movement each week. Great, yeah. thank you. Anyone else on that question? I think we're ready for the next question. I think we've answered. Great, thank you. And you actually went into the next question, so about um, people coming back for more and how it um, will be increased. So that's wonderful that you mentioned that as well. Um, and some of our attendees were eager to learn more about messaging and strategies around healthy food choices for populations and also how agencies and develop programs or spread awareness throughout the community to engage other urban and local growers. I'm just going to jump in and maybe Hillary from the grower side. I think that this concept of regenerative agriculture and soil health and organics is the way to go to talk about food and to really move it into the growing space. Food banks will always be there and, can, and food banks do great work and it's a lot of it is emergency foods. But to really shift the patient population's choices uh, to more plant-based options, because most patients don't get enough plants and vegetable and uh, fruit in their diet, is an imperative. And so we're building that infrastructure to make that happen. So calling out and signaling out that 
health plans, clinics, and growers can come together to build this regenerative approach to food, I think it's one way to promote and talk about it and makes it much more unique. Because when I go to other settings, the, the default answer is the food bank. Nothing, nothing wrong with food banks. They're doing great work. Um, but I think there's an opportunity to, to do the growing piece with the economy um, and uh, the, the impact on the health of the planet as well. I think also, um, you know, a lot of people at this point in our society just have no idea where the food that they're eating comes from, mm -hmm. and they don't know what they're looking at when they're reading these set of ingredients, if they're reading this set of ingredients, and why it matters, or why they are sick or why they're gaining weight, or why they feel so low, or why their kid gets suspended at 11 a.m. because, you know, not thinking about the fact that the kid had Cheetos for breakfast. Like, these are things that people aren't putting, t there's not enough, somehow we're not connecting those dots, I think, as a, I don't know, society. But I do also think that, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so excited for the future of policy change is because, um, you know, it takes more than education and just kind of billboards to tell you what to do or how to think or behavior change, to make behavior change. Um, but when you have a farm across the street from your school um, and you find yourself happening by it every day on your way home and then you happen to walk into it and see this thing that maybe you didn't see or you, you pull a piece of basil off and put it on your slice of pizza, whatever it is, like there's there's an introduction that is physical, that is different than, and it's, and it's behavioral rather than, or experiential, I suppose, rather than sort of being dictated at or preached to. And I think that does, that does um, kind of sink in differently for people. And we're seeing that in our, in our Ashland community because the, the farms that we have there are really visible to the people walking by. And we've had a lot of students come and they've been so shocked that this is like, how stuff happens, and putting your hands in the dirt, and then, and then coming back and wait and seeing that something happened because you put your hands in the dirt changes your experience of, of how you look at food, and um, so, creating some direct relationships with farmers is really important. But you have, but because it's a tough economy, that's why this sort of policy piece has to come into play. And, we have, you know, if right now the government is subsidizing soy and corn, well, that's why people are eating corn syrup filled stuff and soy based products. So there's just a long term goal here that we have to look at shifting all of these dynamics um, to really change these outcomes. But the opportunity to have a network of local, you know, of urban farms that employ local people who begin to understand the value of this, it's going to, it will ripple throughout communities in a way that will be really impactful, but we just have to get there. Thank you. I think we answered that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right, so we have one here about um, traditional pharmacies and if um, they do any partnering to help distribute food at the location of the medicine. We haven't partnered with traditional pharmacies. We're just trying to build out the current food pharmacies that may be an opportunity in the future, but we don't have current work in that space. Great, thank you. And then we also have one question about curriculum and if there are any best practices or evidence based curriculum to help with nutrition education and wellness throughout nutrition. Um, so just if you have any other details about spreading that kind of curriculum within communities. It's a great question. Let me answer one part and then see if Dr. Markle of Liz can answer the other. I can speak to a curriculum for providers and prescribers. And again, like I said, from my own experience and when I talk to young residents and doctors coming out now, it's the same 25 years later, no training in food. So we've developed a curriculum uh, that uh, we think is helpful and effective for our primary care clinicians, and we're ready to share that with people and to coach and teach and provide technical assistance. It is, uh, 
it is an experiential curriculum. We have a chef on board and we try to bring in the food and touch the food and cut, you know, learn knife skills as well as the evidence. And it's really about translational, uh, a translational curriculum because I think many people in academia talk about translational medicine. We're talking about how do you translate this to that patient in a 15 minute visit. I think Liz probably has a lot to say about curriculum. And sure, yeah. I, I can speak about the curriculum that sort of goes into the experience design of the open source wellness behavioral pharmacy. Um, I want to say that even though we're not leveraging or like leaning on, depending on education or information to be sufficient, that we really lean on the experience. Um, we do every week, so just for background, um, participants in the behavioral pharmacy are prescribed by their doctor or their provider who might say, I'm going to write you a prescription, but it's not for medication, it's for participation in a community. And they would then get scheduled to be with us for 16 weeks, and that's a two-hour visit once a week. And during those visits, there's physical movement and stress reduction and a meal and all of that. And then the curriculum component is about a 15-minute, highly experiential, interactive lesson that has to do with one of our four pillars. So the lesson for the day might be on food and nutrition, and we talk about things like eating healthy on a budget and how to read one of those crazy obtuse food labels and, you know, what is the deal with sugar and how much sugar is in things, et cetera. But other lessons are on things that, um, that our patients really brought to our attention. So we have a lesson on, on setting boundaries in interpersonal relationships because so many of our patients are caregivers, they are embedded in complex family systems, and they were really, really struggling. We have lessons on self-care and on setting goals and on you know, how to take mindfulness out of the realm of dogma and into something that they can practice for themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. So the experience and then the curriculum piece is then followed up by um, text-based small group support throughout the week so that when participants learn something via the curriculum, they then are on a text thread with their whole group of about six participants and one health coach checking in with each other and providing support and accountability. And that really helps folks to take an experience that was positive with the information they need to know in order to manifest it in their lives and then the support and the sort of social uplift that it takes to really make something a habit. So that's how we think about curriculum within our program for patients. And there's, there's one more piece, which is the, the Dig Deep Farms managers have developed a curriculum around permaculture design and urban farming, and they teach this to interns coming out of, out of the jail um, in a six-week cohort. Um, and there's 12 principles that are awesome, and I don't have them memorized, so you should look them up. They're really, they're really great, and they, are, seem, they, they connect really deeply and, I think, interestingly, with a lot of the um, health and well-being pieces of the curriculum that have already been mentioned as well. Great. Thanks. Amy, were there additional questions from the group? If not, I've got some closing questions that, I can, that I'll ask folks in the room. Great, thank you so much. It looks like that sums up the majority of our questions here, so you're welcome to go into additional questions that you have. Great. So um, one question that I think came up was a little bit about the cost specifically around the open source wellness work um, and sort of how can, how can this sort of be sustained in clinics and then also I think I'm sure it would be interesting for folks to hear a little bit more about your community um, model and I know that I a couple weeks ago went to one of those sessions and it was amazing and so um, maybe if you'll talk briefly about sort of the the payment model and then also how this works out in the community outside of the clinic. Absolutely. Okay. So the cost I spoke briefly to when we're in the clinical setting, it's really the merging it with a group medical visit that makes it insurance reimbursable. And when a provider is not trying to suddenly become a skilled group facilitator, um, but actually is sort of liberated to do their own individual visits backed up by a whole team of health coaches that is running the program, that provider becomes very, very efficient. And so, you know, I think at Hayward Wellness, we had providers that were billing an average of eight or nine patients in an afternoon with this model billing for about 16. And depending on the reimbursement rate for a given clinic, that generates a lot of extra revenue that then more than covers the cost of the open source wellness program. Um, 
the way that we support people in delivering this program, there's sort of two pathways. One is that clinics can contract with us to deliver the program, and so that's just a sort of a flat annual rate that we will staff it and deliver it and um, use all of our curriculum and our team to, to run it. And then option B that we have used for folks who are not local or not in an area where we're prepared to staff up is that we have trained and licensed the model to groups outside of the, the Bay Area. So um, that's been a really exciting development for us. Um, I'm so glad you did come and visit our community model, and I'd love to hear about your experience if you'd be willing. Um, but yeah, Stephen started to mention that while it's great that the clinic is the point of initiation, right, it's a point where people come seeking help and they get it and, and they're comfortable there, so starting there is great. Um, we find that our participants don't want to graduate, right? Like after 16 weeks, they say, you can't kick me out, are you kidding? And so um, we really do want to have a a seamless pathway that guides folks from the clinical setting into the community setting. So um, just for example, our Oakland-based community site takes prescriptions from clinics all over the Bay Area. Um, we serve folks um, in a very, very similar way, except there's no medical provider there. And then here is just the coolest thing that I have to share is that a bunch of our graduates from the community site, we said, okay, you're done, and they said, no, we're not. Um, so they have launched what they're calling OSWX. So you know like there's TED Talks and TED Ed to X Talks that are the independently organized version. OSWX is an entirely peer-run group of uh, OSW graduates who meet once a week in space that they have gotten for free to do the things that we've taught them. So move, nourish, connect, be. They do all the same things. And instead of a, a curriculum or teaching, there's a sharing, so someone really gets up and tells their story and where they're at in their well-being journey. So this, this gives me hope because while programs are great, it's really a movement that we seek to make a difference. Um, the last thing I'll say is I had a patient sort of on their way out from their first visit say, Liz, is this like church for health or is this like AA for health? And I first thought like, no, God, you know, this, we're not a church, and yet, Churches and, and AA and all the other sort of virally effective um, social structures that meet people's needs work because they are sustainable. And so um, whether we're embedding in housing communities and leveraging HUD funding or embedding in corporations that are self-insured, et cetera, I think we do have to be really, really um, innovative and strategic about how we bring these human essentials, right, these necessities for human goodness out into the community. So while we haven't yet piloted in a school, um, looking at Stephen here, I'm thrilled about the possibility of taking over a school cafeteria and a gym and a play, play space and you know, making evening a time where individual families on, on their own to try to somehow manage life but are supported in creating community as a platform for well-being. Like, wow, what could we do there? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask another question to Hillary around scale and as the work grows, sort of how do you envision scaling the work of Dig Deep Farms? Are you just going to take over every vacant lot in the county? Um, and also around um, how you engage other urban and local growers um, as you think about this work in food as medicine. Yeah, I think that, um, I think every vacant lot should be taken over <laughs> for farming purposes, but um, I think that, you know, dig deep, uh, similar to actually what Liz just laid out around, in a way, mentorship, but I think that dig deep is interested in training others to be able to uh, grow with, within this um, within this manner of, you know, per with these practices of permaculture design and um, regenerative agriculture at the core. And because those are sort of some of the criteria that we think matters for growing medicine as a qualified as medicine. Um, and um, the more people ca that, who can learn how to do that, the better. And the more of, a, of an economy that can be created within that sphere, the better. And in, it really is serving a purpose of community development as well by turning blighted land into something beautiful and valuable to people. Um, so I think there's there's that, and I think that um, as 
as that happens or uh, in, the, in, in the present as we're able to aggregate, as we scale food as medicine now throughout the county and need to aggregate from existing local producers, our intent is to find existing farmers who are using these practices and um, are uh, small and not necessarily already um, benefiting from large contracts with large institutions but need a, need a help, helping hand to be able to scale up. And by being able to purchase from smaller producers and aggregate the produce at our brand new food hub, it took nine years to get built, um, we, can, um, we can really develop a network of local gr small growers um, growing specific items based on their expertise perhaps that can be um, aggregated and processed and then redistributed equitably back out to the clinics. Um, so for example, if, you know, if you're really good at, make, at growing strawberries, yet, but I'm really good at growing kale, then I'm not going to grow strawberries and you're not going to grow kale, but we can work together and be a network that where the, now the clinics get both strawberries and kale. Um, so that is the goal presently and the vision for the future, I think. Do you want to mention the Food Hub and tell folks briefly about that and what that is? Yeah, I think that, you know, all of this, you know, what we're all sort of talking about here is various um, pieces of infrastructure that are really critical to facilitating ultimately health and well-being and safety for us as well, um, which are all, they're all connected. Um, so whether it's the physical pharmacy inside of a clinic, which is a piece of infrastructure that facilitates this delivery, or the, the built you know, environment being a, a farm rather than a piece of concrete. Um, the other piece of infrastructure that we've been working on for so long is this kitchen, this commercial kitchen, which is a 3,300 square foot kitchen um, and food aggregating facility, um, which is intended to be really supportive of this local economy uh, development. So being able to bring produce from all these different farmers up to one um, central location for washing and some level of processing, sorting, and then going back out in refrigerated vans, which is another critical piece of infrastructure, um, uh, to, uh, to the clinics is important. And also um, it will help facilitate food recovery, which is another angle on the food economy where you have paid drivers who are able to pick up food that would have otherwise been wasted from school districts or hospitals and bring that food to low-income housing complexes where they um, maybe wouldn't have been able to afford it. And thirdly, being able to launch local food entrepreneurs um, because there's so many talented um, chefs in our, all of our, tucked away in all of our various communities and the per, getting permits and the ability to produce your, your food legitimately is tough and there are many barriers to making that real. And, with poverty being something that all in and the sheriff's office are equally invested in, in uh, etching away at a little bit, um, we want to help people start businesses. And if those businesses can also buy produce from our local farms as part of their ingredients, we're like closing that loop a little bit on the local food economy, and that is all connected to our goal. Thank you. I have a question for and this is a twofold question to Scott as a, as a leader in the Alliance Health Plan and also to Dr. Mack and Jessica as leaders in the Community Health Center movement. What would you each say to your counterparts that are thinking about doing this as to why they should do this? What, would, what do health and plans need to hear from a health plan leader to say, you know what, we need to do this? What do other community clinic leaders need to hear from you to say, this is why we should do this. And in the interest of time, your elevator pitch version. Mm -hmm. That's right. We have three minutes, so. <laughs> Definitely go for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe now that we are working on logistics and pivoting when we need to, that this will be relatively seamless and such a benefit with really no downside to it. I mean, um, phenomenal community partners, um, 
there's just no downside <laughs> to it. So, uh, again, go for it. Uh, this is Scott. I, I think, too, the, the third pillar I mentioned earlier was about be willing to explore alternatives. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Markle, uh, you know, mentioned about merging the clinic visits in with the wellness visit to make it reimbursable. And to that end, that's where you need to have a lengthy discussion with your local partners to figure out how do we go about doing that, given the current payment mechanisms that exist. And I think to the point I left with was find a way. There is, there is a way when you explore it, but you really have to kind of step out of that status quo box and move into that innovation box to say, hey, we're going to take advantage of all these changes that are kind of sweeping nationally right now on Medicaid reform, and we're going to integrate some new ways of connecting with people. So I'll go back to what I said, find a way. We'll turn it back to you, Amy. All right. Well, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and for sharing with us about the Studis Medicine Program. And um, we look forward to continuing this conversation and continuing to share resources with one another. And just a reminder to Everyone who is attending and participating in this webinar, we will be sharing a follow-up email with additional resources and presentation materials, so keep a lookout for that. And Lola, if you want to move us to the next slide. And we do have some upcoming webinars coming up, so keep a lookout for those emails and um, we will continue to update as far as information that comes out for additional webinars and events. And then we also have our Community Action Academy, which includes uh, resources for the entire Community Action Network. Uh, we have some videos and engagement and virtual networking and a space that um, we will continue to provide updated content for continued learning. And we also have an app that is new for our Community Action Academy, so you're welcome to reach out to our team with any questions about that. And we also have our dates for our next 2020 annual convention, which is in Seattle, Washington, on August 26th to the 28th. So mark your calendars now, and we will continue to update with more information. So thank you again for our amazing panelists today who shared such wonderful information. It was really wonderful to have you, and I know our network was really looking forward to this presentation. And here you see our Learning Communities Resource Center team contact information, so please feel free to reach out with any questions, and we will be in touch with additional resources. So thank you again for all who attended, and we look forward to um, continuing this conversation. Have a great day.